we go from one book, the one we've just seen, to the next that you're getting, uh, and it's that one here I already showed you. We have the author of the book here uh, as our next speaker, uh, Carlos Moreira. Of course, you know him, uh, internet pioneer, cybersecurity expert, and CEO and founder of WiseKey, Swiss company. Uh, he's doing my job in a way. I give uh, the Cermat Summit in your hands. Please give a very warm welcome to Carlos, please. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, I think it's a great subject to connect from the previous speaker to what we are going to be covering now, which is, do we have as a human a future into what we call the fourth industrial revolution? So I am not a writer, I am a CEO of a company which is listed on the Swiss stock market. Uh, actually, this company is the outcome of 17 years career in the UN where I wanted to do good, but in order to do good, you have to have the means to do good. So I have to raise something like $280 million to create a company, which is the company now is able to do good because the company have the mean and the resources to do so. But there is a fundamental problem. I am a member of the uh, World Economic Forum. I was one of the uh, experts that work with the uh, Global Council of the World Economic Forum to design the fourth industrial revolution, which we are entering now. Uh, and one of the things I realized on that work is that where is the human on it? And, and to be honest, uh, th there's a lot of excitement about human future. Everybody thinks that the entrepreneurs are going to be there and we're going to have social impact and we're going to solve the environment. But actually, it's not the case. We are, for the first time in history, of the 200,000 years the human has been on that, this earth, where we are going to be challenged. We just maybe disappear. And the forces are there for. I've been in Silicon Valley, I've been involved in many of the uh, high-level discussion panels on artificial intelligence, and it's so scary what is happening. Why? Because the human is a liability now. So humans are becoming the endangered species. It's not the monkey or the gorilla or the, uh, dino or, or the, or the rhino, it's actually us because we are becoming a liability. And why we are a liability? Because we have a biological envelope. Because for us to learn is so difficult. Because for us to move to the other side of the table, I have to go one step after the other. So humans are progressing in a linear way. Technology is exponential. 16, 32, 64, 128, and so on. So technology exponential growth will be by far superior to whatever evolution of the human is going to go. So how we cope? Obviously, Silicon Valley, $10 trillion economy sitting on the top of the web sees that as a huge opportunity to enhance the human, to provide the human things that we don't have. Actually, we are very good in many things, but we are bad in many essential things. For instance, learning. It takes very easy effort to talk to you guys and express what, uh, what, what I have to say today, but it's so slow for us to learn. How long it takes to learn piano or to play music like, like we, uh, Elizabeth uh, did, did it today. How many years of, of, of training that requires? So this is too slow for machines. Machines cannot wait for humans to learn. So the danger is that machines will replace us in things then they will do much better. So, so in that dialogue, and, and after talking to MIT Media Lab, I went to the UN, I went to the uh, uh, Human Rights Council, I went to the Security Council, I went to TED. I mean, you know, people that they know me, sees me travel around the world. I went to China, I want to talk to the Chinese government and say, I went to the Vatican, actually, we're going to have later uh, an amazing person from the Vatican, which is an AI expert. And, and the conclusion was that we have to put the human back to the center of gravity. So the internet is like an, it's more, a huge cosmos where things float around. So the center of gravity now, the internet, is actually owned by companies, what we call the GAFAs, you know? Those companies they are so powerful now that they are replacing government. They are replacing anything that takes a decision of human. They have so much data that, that they are able to predict or future or behavior or emotion. They can manipulate those emotions. I'm sure many of you have been seeing Netflix movie on, on the big hack and how a company like uh, Cambridge Analytica was able to put uh, uh, Trump in power. And uh, not only Trump, and also put the ideas British, then they have to access the European Union because they manipulate their emotion because they have so much data about us. They, they know everything. They know when we're going to get married. They know when we're going to divorce. They know where, where is our sexual orientations or religious orientations. And we are being inundated with fake news and deep fakes that they are able to change our behavior. So obviously, a human has the final say because we vote and there are human voting. But what about if that vote was manipulated by that? We take financial decisions 
decisions, we, we buy things. What about if those financial decisions have been manipulated by artificial intelligence? <laughs> We also are in a situation where we are educating our kids. What about if your education we're going to give to our kids are based on those fake, uh, fake, fake, uh, fake uh, uh, information that we receive? So things have to change. And to be honest, we are like we are in climate change. We are about five years in what we're going to call irreversibility. If we don't solve it in five years, it's gone. We will be what uh, singularity people in Silicon Valley say. They say, guys, the, the, the biological envelope is so cumbersome, is so heavy. Let's transplant ourselves into a computer brain. And that computer brain will uh, extract all your memories, so everything you did, the schools and everything. Because when we think memories, when you think uh, where you've been in your school and you maybe figure your school, that you don't really have a database in your brain with the pictures of your school. Those are signals. They are chemical signals that they are created at the moment that that question happens. Those chemical signals now can be transferred to computers, and computers can regenerate those, those, those signals. Obviously, the computer will then go to your uh, school, take pictures of the school, and add it to those signals, so you could regenerate the entire life of a person into a computer. So the transhuman code, and the, wor and, and the word is, is, is actually challenging, it, it's reversing the logic, saying, OK, if this is where we go, and we have a $10 trillion economy building on that, Let's build companies that protect human. Let's invest in companies that they protect human. Let's consume products that they are human friendly. Let's choose universities that they empower the, the, the human behavior. Let's unleash the potential of human. Because humans, we have been here for 200,000 years. And by the way, we are the most perfected technology yet. Or eyes are much better than any camera, or ears are able to identify sounds that no speaker on earth will be able to do. They weigh or, organ or organize, recycle themselves. They are by far superior to any biological process. So how can we do it? How we can move from the witchable thinking to a very organized industry, which is now $10 trillion, moving to $100 trillion in five years, and $2,000 trillion by the year 2060? How you fight against that? The only way is creating the awareness of the consumer. So the only weak point this company has, all of them depend on the consumers. If the consumers are not happy, and you see what happened with Facebook once Facebook was uh, uh, attacked by the US Congress, they started to ask the right question, then they started to back off because they realized that the consumers were getting like, OK, maybe I am the product of this platform, and maybe I should not be the product of that platform. I want to move it away. So that's the, the entire move on of the transhuman code. So we are bringing universities, governments. Uh, I mean, this is, this is a totally non-for-profit activity. We are doing that through a foundation. Wiseki doesn't make any money on that. But what we are creating is an environment where we want to empower the person. I really want to enhance the human, because we're going to be enhanced. We have been enhanced all our lives. You guys think that you might not be technology, but you're all already cyborgs. All of you have a mobile phone, and all of you with that mobile phone are already connected to the digital world. So the moment you do that, the moment you have a mobile phone connected to the digital world, you are in the limit between human and cyber. And the other thing that's going to happen is going to be accelerating that process. The mobile phone is going to get smaller. There's going to be potential implants like Elon Musk launching a company that where they can implant on your brain a chip that will learn faster than what you will be able to learn yourself, they will collect data. So what we are <coughs> aiming on the book, and that's how we vectorize the book, is to say, OK, if we all agree that the humans is the most perfected technology on Earth, because the humans have things that computers will never have. We have emotions, for instance. One of the things in AI, and we run a lot of AI research and algorithms, AI blocks in emotion. When you, when you explain AI what is crying, or what is love, or what is anger, or what is uh, sensibility, AI doesn't know about it. AI gets kind of confused. It, it mimics. AI can start to cry, but cry because it's seeing you cry, so it mimic, but doesn't have the biological uh, structure to feel those emotions that humans have. To the point that we are saying, are we going to educate our kids to do things that computers will be able to replicate because they're going to be much faster and smarter than we are? Obviously not. You're not going to 
teach your kid how to code. People are talking, we uh, entrepreneurs have to uh, learn how to code. Forget about it. Computers will be able to auto code themselves within two years. They're already the code of, of big platforms are not done by humans anymore. Are we going to give our kids uh, a, a legal work? Forget about it. Legal is going to be totally uh, digitalized and blockchain technology through ledger technology is going to make the work of legal people totally obsolete. So where are we going to put our kids to learn? On things that they are related to emotions. So think jobs on earth. Their human emotion makes the difference. Treating a patient in a hospital, being friendly with a person when you are serving the coffee, being uh, in, in a listen mode when somebody has a problem, those are the jobs of the future, emotions. So my, my, my belief is, and I really 100% behind that notion that maybe Artificial intelligence will push us to become actually humans because we abandon those things. In my career, when I started, having emotion was a weakness. If you have a man and cries in a movie, everybody say, what was going on with this guy? Or, but, but, but actually, emotions are essential. They are undiscovered territories where the human jobs of the future will be. Now, we will have much more time for us. We're not going to need to work eight hours a day. But we might not even to work at all, because in some models now, we are reaching a point where we could eventually create enough wealth for the entire world. So we will have to use our time in a totally different way. We will have to use our capabilities in ways than the computer. And then computers will become an enabler. Elizabeth, without this beautiful piano, could explain to us for 20 hours what music will be. And we will be there sitting and say, OK, great. But it takes her only two seconds. And, and she inspires us with the music. So she needs the piano. Without the piano, she cannot express herself. The same thing us as a human. Without the computers, we will not be able to express ourselves because computers are going to be there to help us to become a better human, enhance our capability without destroying our emotion. So what we are doing in order to make the, and, and thanks to Christopher, it's the third year I'm here, and I love what he's doing. I think, and I, I've been all over those forums around the world, and I, I am a speaker in all of them. And, and, and the vision that he had to create a human-centric forum where people from all the different organizations, different countries, different professions can come here to express their humanity, their emotions, where, where, where those emotions come from life experience, for religious belief, whatever, but those emotions are the driver of all of discussion. You can be sure that this forum will become the most important forum of the future because no other forum is doing that and the ones that they are doing something like that has already been compromised too far and too big by, by, by the lobbies and they are making those forums non-emotional. So let's create an emotional society. So and as an emotional society, I have one area which is very deep in my, in my work. I was as an expert at the United Nations for many years. I work in electronic commerce. Actually, I was sending data uh, for free to Jack Ma. Jack Ma was my focal point in China. And Jack Ma made Alibaba, and now he's the richest man in China. So it shows how much data is available in Geneva, how you can monetize. But one of the problems I have been fighting for many years is anti-illicit trade. Wineski has held over one million watches in Switzerland not to be copied. We have helped the medical industry not to uh, put, put technology on their products to not be counterfeited. Uh, we have been working on uh, projects related to uh, the dark web. Uh, the dark web moves now $2.2 uh, $2 trillion economy. So the bank account of the big guys are located in the dark web. I don't know if you, any of you have ever visited the dark web, but if you ever want to be really scared, you spend one hour in the dark web and you just write your name and you will see how much dark web will know about you. Every time you lost your credit card, every time you lost uh, uh, your identity card, every time you lost a document, it's very likely that document is on the dark web. So that economy, which is an extraordinarily nefast economy, it is driven by mafias of the world. This is the bank account of the bad guys. This is where from they get the money to put child slavery, prostitution, all the problems that you're facing now in the society which is the uh, uh, destroying the human dignity is actually paid by, by, by this uh, underground economy. So we launched uh, last year a, uh, an initiative here at the uh, uh, Zermatt Summit, uh, which was a panel on illicit trade. We have worked a lot since one year. And again, that's another recommendation I give you guys is that Coming here, make commitments, and next year show that you, your commitment has advanced. Don't come in here only on leasing mode because 
nobody wants to listen anymore. We want action. And, and you know, the, the, I've been working with the uh, Clinton Initiative for 10 years with President Clinton, and he had a, a, a very interesting say. He said, you make a commitment, we evaluated that commitment. If you didn't perform, next year you're not invited. <laughs> And actually, that was an excellent way to put process because it's easy to talk, it's hard to deliver. So we, we did that. We, we put a, a, an amazing group of experts that they are going to meet now working on illicit trade. We launched the anti-illicit trade declaration, which is going to be uh, available for the uh, uh, companies that they are joining the panel to sign. We also uh, put it on the internet so everybody can sign. You guys can sign. I can sign the book for free uh, if you ask me in exchange that you sign the declaration. So the, uh, the idea of this declaration is to bring more multinational. Uh, this year we have uh, an amazing, uh, I, you, I don't want to give uh, any headlines, the panel will say, um, news for you. Uh, this declaration is going to get much bigger. Uh, we are talking to pharmaceutical companies. We are talking to uh, um, e-commerce companies like, uh, like Alibaba like Amazon, all of them to enter into this uh, illicit trade declaration. This illicit trade declaration could be one of the uh, landmark milestone achievement of the Surma Summit. So without more, I just would like to bring this amazing panel here. We're going to debate. Sorry, I'm taking your moderation role, but I'm sure you will excuse me because the subject is very specialized. Uh, we want to get as mass maximum as we can during the following minutes so I invite the panel to join me now here. And I give a, a big hand to this panel because it's an amazing group of experts. <laughs> David. <coughs> That's it, Magister. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, we have, yeah, the, we have Frank as well. So just to give you a, a, an orientation, what an amazing panel here. We have a United Nations official, we have a priest, we have an expert in illicit trade for many years on the tobacco industry, and one of the uh, best technology experts on how to bring illicit trade to the technology front. And we are gonna debate all about the same subject, which is how to reduce illicit trade. So maybe just a, a very short introduction, who you are, what you do in your own uh, organizations, and then we start the fire on, on the question and A. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, well, as you say, I work for uh, the UN. For the better part of my professional life, I've been working for the UN, more specifically for uh, an organization that is called UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization. We are focused on developing countries. We're not an association of manufacturers uh, to support the interests of manufacturers where are they lo wherever they are located, uh, but we're promoting uh, industrial development for socioeconomic uh, good. Thank you very much. So thank you, Carlos, for the kind words, and thank you for the Zenit uh, Summit for inviting Philip Morris and myself. Uh, my name is Alvise Giustiniani. I've been working for Philip Morris International for more than 20 years. So unlike the, the entrepreneurs that decided to leave at the multinational, I stayed on. Nobody is perfect. Uh, I'm Italian. Um, I've been doing different jobs in, in Philip Morris over the last... Uh, 20 plus years, and in the last five years, as Carlos mentioned, I'm responsible for the department that is fighting illicit trade worldwide. And that's why I think uh, I'm here today. Father so, <laughs> I am Gianfranco Bassi, I'm professor, I'm a priest, and I am professor uh, of philosophy of natural science at the Pontifical Lateral University, the University of the Holy See. Um, but uh, since my doctoral work, I worked in uh, computer science and neural networks, and then I, my, I developed uh, during all my life <coughs> my research in uh, the foundation of computer science, logic and computer science, and uh, now also in quantum computing. And uh, I am actually involved also with the National Research Council in Italy uh, with the development of the new architecture of quantum optical quantum computer with application also for uh, uh, quantum encryption for the customer, that is for the Internet of Things. And, um, and also I am involved in the, uh, ethics in, uh, in artificial intelligence, but I speak about this. Yeah, for a minute. Yeah. Thank you very much, Father. Yeah, David. So I'm Dave Behrens. Uh, my day job is working in a company named Sukafina. Uh, we're a coffee trading company. 
uh, vertically integrated. We have some farming and some roasting activities, but the majority of what we do is trading. Uh, roughly about one out of every 20 cups of coffee go through our supply chain. Uh, during my nights, weekends, and, and the rest of free time, I've been working on a tech startup company, which is using blockchain and digital identity and cross-border payments in hopes of being able to connect farmers and consumers in a more tangible way uh, within smallholder <laughs> farmer commodities. Thank you very much. So, so maybe I suggest that we start by defining the problem first, so we all understand what is the problem, and then we move a bit on, on the solution to that problem. So, so maybe, Alvisa, because you, you have so much experience on illicit trade in, in a very sensitive area, which is the tobacco industry. What, 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 from where you come from, your, your passion to anti-illicit trade, what was the driver on that, and, and, and what is the problem we are facing here internationally? Well, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, Philip Morris, uh, you'd wonder why Philip Morris International, a company producing uh, tobacco products uh, and now new heated non, uh, heated not burn products, uh, um, why, why are we interested in fighting illicit in the first place? I think the reason is, is simple and it's twofold. The first is because illicit is bad for the business, and second is because it's the right thing to do. And so why is it bad for a business? Because uh, um, the illicit cigarettes are basically taking away business to the legal business. It's sold to a legal company like Philip Morris. Uh, one out of 10 cigarettes, a bit uh, similar to the figure that was shown on our pharma products, one out, of cigarette, one out of 10 cigarettes smoked today is illicit. Um, the OECD did a, did a report uh, a few years ago and I think those are the figures uh, that Carlos was referring, referring to. The illicit, the counterfeit products are worldwide, uh, it's not only cigarettes, but all counterfeit products are, uh, is around two to three percent of uh, worldwide uh, trade, so a big number. Um, so the, the fight against illicit for Philip Morris, it makes business sense. Uh, a pack of cigarettes is expensive but maybe many people don't know that 80% give or take is uh, taxes, being at excise tax, being at the VAT, being at import taxes. So while you pay a lot of money for the, for, for, for the pack, um, the, most of it goes to governments. Now, if you're a listed producer, what you do, you don't pay the taxes and it's easier then to, to compete on the, on the market. So that's the first reason it's a huge problem for, for us from a business standpoint, but the second reason for me is even more important is uh, to do the right thing. And what I, mean, what I mean by that is that the illicit trade is not impacting only the businesses, but it's impacting society. So the government losing income due to less revenues, um, the legal business is losing jobs, so that is uh, another, another issue. Develop the, the, um, Illicit trade is always is fueling organized crime. Um, so while we think that uh, buying a pack of cigarettes uh, illegally on the black market uh, will save some money, actually it's fueling a chain of uh, that uh, organized crime. And these organized crimes are businesses. They they want to make money with a, um, a higher profit possible at the lowest risk. And they will uh, trade in cigarettes, but they will trade in pharma products, they will trade in drugs, uh, people, and you name it. Because any product that they, where they can make money. So it is impacting, and, and recently there was a study done uh, by a company called, uh, NGO called Trace It, together with UNCTAD, which is a sister organization of the UN, uh, responsible for trade and development, and, and, and this report was basically linking illicit trade, not only on cigarettes, but all illicit trade, with the uh, sustainable development goals, so the SDGs, clearly on a negative way. So linking that illicit trade was an impediment to each single SDG. So illicit trade was an impediment to each single SDG. So that is, I think, the second reason which in our company is becoming more and more prominent is really to do the right thing for societies. And once again, that's, that is where the sustainability comes back. Doing the right thing for society means doing the right thing for, for, for the consumers, and then clearly it's the right thing also for the corporation, because we, in Asia, have a kind of business, are uh, basically, um, we are the shareholders, but the main stakeholder in any company is the consumer. So they are where it all comes back. Thank you, Richard. Frank, on 
moving to the international organizations, one, one of the major roles of the international organization is, is to create awareness with their, their focal points, which are governments, <laughs> right? And, and UNIDO is the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. So industrial development is, is becoming ever and ever more and more needed mm -hmm. because that's what it's all about, about the fourth industrial revolution, right? How you can build a sustainable <laughs> development and how you can ensure that everybody can participate and not only a group of countries mm -hmm. can benefit of. Well, one of the, um, the things that Davos has been uh, pretty upsetting the last year is that they say the uh, technology revolution that we started 30 years ago, there was a meeting in Geneva with uh, Tim Mansley, Lee, which he was nearly crying by saying, I am so disappointed with what, what the web ha has become, because only uh, about 1% of the people got uh, anything back. The other 99%, they absorbed the entire wealth creation of the web. That's why you have so many billionaires made on technology. So, so that was a fiasco basically, because you don't develop a, a technology platform with, with the objective to, to have 99% of mm -hmm. the wealth in the hands of 1% of the people. So as an international organization uh, expanding industrial development, what are the, your drivers? What keeps you busy? And, and, and what is the advice that you give to all of us in order to, to, to expand or, or, or reach into developing countries? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Carlos, and I'm happy to say that you uh, I'm happy to hear that you uh, stress the importance of industrial development. Uh, for the longest time, uh, this has been uh, not recognized, not sufficiently recognized for a variety of largely um, ideological reasons. Um, I believe that uh, the performance of uh, socioeconomic uh, performance of uh, China, the track record, lifting uh, millions of people out of poverty uh, on the environmental front, uh, it has been less successful, but certainly in terms of inclusivity, uh, this, is, uh, this is certainly um, an example. Um, and it has triggered the attention of particularly uh, lower income countries, uh, African countries, notably least developed countries. And as you might well be aware, this is top of the agenda. Uh, listen to any African political uh, gathering, business people as well. Industrial development is one of the, the top priorities. African Development Bank ranks it among the five top uh, priorities. So it is, it is important politically. Um, we need to create, uh, we need to create uh, jobs. Um, earlier on there was reference to, uh, to migration, well, uh, I'm not saying that the industrial sector, the manufacturing sector, when we speak about industrial development, it's largely manufacturing industry, that the jobs will come solely from there, but it's a crucial piece of the puzzle. Uh, the connection, intersectoral production linkages, the connection that manufacturing industry has with agriculture, with services, very important. So we see this as a crucial piece of the puzzle, and if Africa in particular and LDC countries do not industrialize or do not increase their share of manufacturing value added over the next 10 years, there might be a serious problem. You were referring to five years, uh, but 10 years to build yeah. technological capabilities because much of the technological capabilities at lower levels of income will have to be developed through manufacturing production. Right. So, so, so this, is, uh, this is key and this is a uh, uh, an effort that we are supporting together with, uh, with, with, with UNCTAD um, and, uh, and many other agencies, WHO when it comes to pharmaceuticals, yep. uh, UNAIDS as well when it comes to ph pharmaceutical production, uh, FAO when it comes to, um, uh, to agricultural, agri-food, uh, and the illicit trade is an important um, element uh, in this. Uh, we are in principle very, uh, very committed uh, to reducing uh, the negative effects of, of industrial trade, of, of uh, illicit trade because precisely it um, crowds out legitimate, in our case, manufacturing. Um, I think, you know, I, I've been working in many of the international organizations, and I think I, the UN now is, uh, is in a unique position to really uh, influence the way the world is going to be in the future. The Sustainable Development Goals is one, one of it, but, but also at the intra-agency level, because for instance, in your case, you need to industrial, as you say, industrial now is it's, it's key because we are not going to have a, a fifth industrial revolution if we don't solve the fourth industrial revolution we are entering, right? So, so your mandate is so powerful. It's like ITU, for instance, that so many years they were trying to figure out where they sit, and now they have a very clear mandate on, on, on the internet, right? The regulation of the internet. So I think the UN agencies have an amazing role, especially if you continue uh, part uh, partnership with the private sector. Mm -hmm. So maybe, because we're going to move now into the technology, any questions or any uh, clarifications on, on the subject has been covered now. I, I prefer to have a Q&A at this point rather to accumulate a lot of notions. If you have anything, uh, the floor is yours. We are talking now about illicit trade, about the problem, about the solutions, 
about the role of international organizations, about how this could be uh, disrupted by the proper cooperation. Okay? Okay. So we move to a more deep dive on technology now. And, and, and I want to uh, express my, my amaze uh, with uh, Father Gianfranco. I met him in the Vatican because Weiski did the uh, launch of the Transhuman Code in the Vatican uh, in, a, in an event organized with the Humanity 2.0, which is a very interesting uh, group that has been uh, discussing with CEOs uh, around the world about the influence of uh, this uh, disruption that is happening in technology vis-a-vis -vis the humans and how we can educate the humans so we can continue to be human. So, so he was a speaker, and when he started to talk about artificial intelligence, quantum technology, I say, wow, I mean, this is a priest that, that give a mass in the morning, as we were this morning with him, and, and, and then he is, is, a, is an expert on, on quantum physics with a philosophical, and I, know I learned something from him, which is unique. He told me uh, the fact that the humans have lost the connection with uh, philosophy is putting us in a dangerous situation because everything that has been done before in technology, philosophy was a major driver, was a major driver for mathematics, was a major driver for engineering, and suddenly AI is getting outside that, that connection. So maybe can you elaborate on, on that bridge between philosophy, technology, and, and, and what you explained me this morning about the uh, synergies between quantum and the creation of the world, the genesis. If mm -hmm. you don't mind to spend a few minutes on that, I think everybody's <laughs> going to be blow away with that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, please, uh, Father. So, um, it's possible to show the PowerPoint, so Sammy. Yeah, sure. If there is uh, the, uh, the, yeah, you, the you pointer. Have it, uh, yeah. You have it already. If you want to yes, go to the floor, okay. please. So, it's better. So, I can, yes. Uh, okay, this is a, an application, okay? Then we speak about this. This is the, my research area at the Lateran University. Uh, this is, um, uh, the name is Prometheus, is uh, um, a startup company in the Institute for Mi Microelectronics and Microsystems in the Italian Research Council. And so, uh, in, so that we have uh, all the labs there, also a linear accelerator for the deposition of molecules of our substrates. So we have everything there. And so, uh, no, pay attention. For the, back. For the, um, for the first question, that is how to relate uh, philosophy with uh, artificial intelligence. I organized for the next October here, you have also the possibility to connect. Uh, I am one of the co-organizers of the um, European Computer Science Society Summit of the 2019. And so my struggle about this is this. Uh, you know, probably an interview of uh, Smith, the, the CEO of Microsoft, Microsoft, who said that right. uh, the true challenge in AI now is not what computer can do, but what computer must do. And for this, uh, there is the possibility for philosophers, uh, lawyers, and ever theologians. But the problem is that, <laughs> you know probably that there is in Europe this law uh, for computational thinking from kindergarten to high school, no? But the only place in which uh, computer science is not taught is in the philosophy and law departments. So how is it possible? Because if you go in a scientific department, you, t you, you learn <laughs> computer science. The only two places in all the academy <laughs> in which uh, uh, computer science is not taught is, uh, um, is the department of philosophy and computer science. So how is it possible? to win the challenge of ethics in artificial intelligence. And so we, we give uh, the, the ethics only to, with all my respect, to the computer engineering. So they are not experts in this. So it's necessary that uh, philosophers and computer science, uh, philosophers and computer science and lawyers work together, sharing the same uh, expertise, okay? And so, which is the link about uh, this, this, that is the scientific disciplines and humanistic disciplines? 
is a new discipline. Now it's just published on Springer in textbooks, uh, in collection of Springer, um, the introduction of formal philosophy. Which is formal philosophy? Formal philosophy is to use uh, um, a symbolic logic, axiomatic method for formalizing, is already applied since uh, uh, Frege and since Riemann to mathematical science, the axiomatic method. But the problem is to apply the axiomatic method also to philosophy, to humanistic discipline. And also to use the proper logic, it's not mathematical logic, of course, uh, otherwise uh, you <laughs> stay in the neopositivism approach, uh, but uh, the modal logic, a formal logic, modal logic can be formalized, it can be implemented also in, uh, in computers, so that we can insert ethical, ethical algorithms in uh, autonomous system overall, before all autonomous system, because they take decision, and they must take decision not only for maximizing, for instance, the profit, I think, to um, uh, automatic trading online. <laughs> I participated in inventing trading online, <laughs> because when I was a, a consultant of the Bank of Italy, <laughs> we invented the method before the crisis of 2008, of um, making neural nets for prevision. We have to, 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 to deal with the, the exchange between yen and dollars, because our debts in Italy is in dollars, but our reserve are yen. So when, if you change <laughs> at the right moment between yen and dollars, you save a lot of money. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, we had a, a beautiful group of people working with the Italian Office of Exchange on this problem, and we invented a very effective method with a very small neural nets, <laughs> learning from the, the first uh, three steps. You know that uh, Bloomberg every 10 seconds, no? Send, uh, so before we study four, four years of uh, this exchange, imagine how many, how many data. And then uh, we realized that there is no correlation for this reason, neural networks cannot work this. But uh, then <laughs> we, we discovered that um, effectively the value uh, fills the, the last three bits from Bloomberg. So that we make um, a practically a neural net in continuous learning. Uh, it works. It worked. <laughs> worked so well <laughs> that uh, now uh, standard imports, because uh, then, uh, for some strange, uh, uh, we don't apply in this uh, for Italian government. But uh, I, I was invited in the bank, uh, in the World Bank, to explain with the uh, wow, all the people. Yes, this is the right neural net <laughs> for. And then uh, I rediscovered that in 2000, after the crisis of 2008, Standard and Poor applied this for recovery in one year, all the lost, using a, a farm of computers working in this, uh, with this algorithm. There was a scandal, but now you have 43% uh, uh, of the transactions are made in this way. Father, if you don't mind, because we would like to maintain the, the interaction. Yes. Let, let's, let's go to, um, to, to the panel, and after yes, I bring you back again on Quantum, if you don't mind. Yes. Because I want to keep okay, these okay. guys, uh, otherwise they, they, they're going to forget what they have to say. Let's <laughs> 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 keep going. But, 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 uh, but what I think was, is, is phenomenal on this, which is I, uh, after, after so many uh, meetings with AI experts, mm -hmm. I learned that this was not connected with uh, uh, philosophy, which philosophy we can consider an emotion, right? Emotional mm -hmm. thinking, because philosophy is really emotional. Uh, and, and philosophers before were viewed as, 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 as something that it doesn't bring any value. Uh, and maybe because we disconnect philosophy from AI, we are facing so many problems on AI, what we call AI bias, and the fact that he said, the AI's algorithms now, they are programmed by a bunch of young kids in Silicon Valley. I mean, the entire AI world is maybe programmed for 100,000 engineers. So 100,000 engineers, we have some of them, they have uh, too young to even have any moral values. They are dictating the way we drive our cars, the way we do everything in life, right? 
So bringing that connection back has a huge uh, phenomenal um, uh, disruption capability. So, so if you don't mind, we, we're going to move now to Sukafina. Sukafina is a trading company in Geneva, family a company from uh, many, many, many 40 years. Yes, and, and an amazing um, uh, traders in, in coffee. And, and, uh, and, and David is, is a technology um, focused person. So we have been uh, brainstorming on how uh, to empower farmers because in the, uh, in the supply chain process on coffee, when you go to uh, a Starbucks and you buy a uh, macchiato or whatever with uh, $7, the macchiato, and, and you realize that the farmer that has uh, contributed to that coffee bean only makes uh, 10 cents, you should be feeling guilty. And actually, we all feel guilty, but nobody has really the capability, the technical capability of not feeling guilty by just providing to that farmer a, a, a piece of, of that $7. I mean, I'm sure if, if I will know where is the farmer, I could have a picture of it, a geolocation other, the, the speaker before mentioned about the uh, address of it because it has geolocation. If I have that information, I should be able to just plug and send a few dollars. So that's what uh, they have done and I let you develop from there on. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, within the coffee industry, I think it has to start with the farmer. Um, at the end of the day, if there's not economic viability for farming, we can't ask farmers to be taking care of the environment, to be taking care of social. Uh, the farmer has to first feed their family. Uh, if they can't feed their family, they can't send their kids to school. And so we, we need to think about that economic viability, and I wish it was 10 cents that they would receive out of a cup of coffee. In reality, it's more like three to five cents. So it's a, it's a very small portion of the pie. And I think that what I've learned in 20 years of coffee trading is there's always a debate. Do roasters make too much money, roasters and retailers? Do farmers not make enough? And, and it's a debate that's gone on for probably the last 100 years and, and would continue to go on. So our approach has been a little bit different. We think that the future of coffee is traceability. Yeah. It, it's really in knowing where the coffee is coming from. And, and of course, in specialty coffee and some of the unique uh, communities on small scale, it's very easy to have traceability. You could go to a very specific farm, you can buy coffee from that farm, and you can transport it. But when you start talking about scaling, global scaling, it becomes very complex. To give you an idea, Sukafin is the leading exporter of coffee out of Rwanda, and one container of coffee that we might ship out of Rwanda could have been contributed by up to 4,000 farmers. So it becomes very complex because you're taking different batches of coffee and you're having to put them together. So every time you take batch A that came from 100 farms and batch B that comes from 100 farms and put them together, you're creating a new output that could have been contributed by 200 farms. So it's been something that's been quite difficult, but we've spent a lot of effort and time working on. And we started with an idea, it became a business plan, and then ultimately it became a standalone company. It's, it's named Farmer Connect. Uh, it's actually going to be launched on Wednesday, so hopefully you guys will, will be able to see a headline somewhere uh, in the world and go, oh yeah, that was that. that one, of, one of those coffee guys at the conference. Because this is a coffee conference, I don't know if if you guys are aware of this. We, we've kind of snuck up on you, but we're, we're pesky like that. Um, so we, we started and we said it has to start with the farm. So when you speak to farmers, they say economic viability, of course, but then they have two other concerns. They say differentiation. Yeah. You know, you talk to a farmer and they're like, I take care of my wastewater. I take care of the people that pick the coffee. I, I do all the right things, all the environmental things. My neighbor doesn't do any of them. Yet when we go to market, my coffee gets sold for the exact same price as my neighbor. So why am I doing that? I mean, they know why they're doing it. It's because of their own moral integrity, but there's not been a way to differentiate. The second thing is that we oftentimes tell them, you should raise your productivity levels. You should produce better quality coffee, and we do good agriculture practices to help them do that. They do all the work, nine months of labor, the coffee leaves the farm, and they never hear from it again. Did people care? Do people like it? Did it matter? So those are, those are some of the issues we're tackling. So the first thing we're starting with is uh, digital identity, uh, farmer-owned digital identity. It gives the farmer the capacity to have a digital CV, and when they do good agriculture practices, when they win awards, when they do environmental work, when they do sustainability work, it's now going to be a digital certificate that goes under that farm's identity. 
and, and it gives a chance for differentiation of product. Which everybody will need because a digital identity is what Facebook does with your wall. You have actually a digital identity but it's owned by Facebook and Facebook monetizes that digital identity between $250 and $400 per year. So that's how much you worth as a product. So imagine that digital identity is on control of the farmer. The farmer could sell that identity under his consent to anybody then they will be interested to do the deals with the farmer or to geolocate the farmer. But it's the farmer that decides when to give that consent and it's the farmer that gets the benefit of that consent. So Thank this you. is a consent economy. Thank you for, for adding that. That's very important. And it's good to have that clear that the business model of Farmer Connect is not to monetize data. Yes. That, that's not what we want to do. So we want to be GDPR plus, plus, plus. Yeah, you know, we, we want to give the farmer an identity that they own that I don't even have today. Yeah. The second part of the, the application is allowing farmers to, to confirm transactions. So today, when a trader buys coffee from a farmer, we might record in our handheld their, their name, how much we paid them, and then we make sustainability reports that say, we're good people, we pay good prices. But with the farmer, we just have a paper receipt. They sign it, we sign it, we keep it. If somebody wants to audit us, we have to pull out those 2,000 paper receipts to prove that we paid that price. But by digitalizing the supply chain, the digitalization in and of itself is not so special, but it's the verification of digital data that becomes really powerful. So now, imagine a farmer being able to confirm, I, would, I did receive that fair price. I did sell that quantity, and that becomes the beginning of our trace. So from there, we have a traceability platform that tracks where the coffee's gone, how it's been transformed, and when it's occurred. And, it, and that traceability platform also embeds pricing data. Yeah. So you're able to track the price that's been paid across the supply chain. Yeah. All that data then can be facing the consumer. We have a consumer facing app called Thank My Farmer, where consumers actually via a QR code or a barcode or any way would be able to pull that data onto a handheld, be able to pull up an interactive map that's pulling the data from the blockchain to be able to understand where that coffee's journey has gone and also be able to see sustainability projects that are linked to it. And they, they're able to learn about those projects, share those projects, and even contribute directly to those projects. How big is the coffee economy from, uh, from your... So the green coffee that we purchase is $20 billion. Consumers spend $200 billion buying it. Yet the $20 billion are trying to solve all the problems of sustainability. How much the farmers are getting now today? The, out of the $20 billion, maybe half of that, yeah. $10 billion. So our view is, rather than fight over the $200 billion, yeah. Why don't we grow the pie from 200 to 220 billion, yes. but in a way that consumers are directly able to contribute back to the beginning part of that chain? And the beauty of that model is that a farmer identity is not only a farmer identity, it's the identity of the person, which is farmer. So that identity is also good for medical services because uh, you, we have a project actually in India with, uh, with um, fertilizer farmers, then they use the fertilizer to fertilize the land. And it's the same thing. Once you have an identity, then the farmer exists. You know, the digital identity is part of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals of the UN because currently 1.2 billion people on Earth do not have even a legal identity. They just don't exist. So if, you, if a person doesn't exist, how are you going to help that person? How are you going to bring help to that person or subsidies or anything that you want to? So the first, and that's why identity has become one of the major SDG uh, uh, priorities because without solving the problem of identity, it's very hard to solve the, the, the other problems. Yeah. yeah, in Africa, what we see is that most, most farmers don't have bank accounts. Yeah. They're not bankable. They don't have access to micro credit because they don't have credit history. Yeah. So suddenly, if you empower them to be able to confirm transactions and confirm income received, yeah. now you're building credit history. Yeah. And via that credit history, we trust there's lots of other young, smart entrepreneurs, hopefully many of them in the emerging uh, market and world that will build on top of this application. Yeah, actually, here in the room, you have the, the, uh, you have the uh, coffee uh, machine, and we are drinking coffee, Absolutely. which sits <laughs> perfectly on the top of what you're trying to do. Absolutely. To, to so, so we just view it as a platform that other entrepreneurs are going to be able yeah. to build on top of. Um, it, it's an inclusive agenda. So the what, what I like uh, in your case, the same case of PMI, is that for, you, you see organizations, and they are very large. I mean, PMI is, is, is a huge uh, company, one of the largest employers in Switzerland. And they, they are redesigning themselves towards the, uh, the user, the, uh, the consumer. And this was not there before. One of the failures of the UN, uh, and I include myself because I was there at that time, is that we were totally disintermediated with the end user. You know, we were always talking at the institutional level. So we all agree among ourselves 
but we didn't have the last mile, which was what it was required to reduce poverty or to increase the well-being of, of, of six billion people on Earth. This, this new uh, uh, concept of platform, it's, it's actually powerful because once you have a platform, it, you can connect so many things. The platform should not should be open, should be open source, you should give away your software so people adapt. So that's the new spirit, right, where, yeah. where you get inclusion rather than exclusion. So, so maybe on that, uh, and again, my, my job here is also to establish relations mm -hmm. because that's what I think we're going to be very successful on this. Who says he's a farmer of coffee can be a farmer of tobacco, right? Or so, so, so what are you doing for farmers and, and how that could fit? Listen to what you're saying. I can relate to tobacco in the same way. Mm -hmm. You have uh, so many small uh, tobacco producers uh, uh, which are maybe less than a half an hectare or even really s small parts. Uh, and, and it's difficult then uh, to be able to um, track the tobacco and we have the same, same issues though, because uh, um, the traceability of the tobacco, making sure especially there is no child labor, uh, is something we take uh, very uh, seriously. But it is not that easy because um, just how, they, how the environment is scattered. Uh, but I think what we're doing in many markets in, uh, in, uh, in Pakistan, for example, so you also consider that they're difficult to markets to work in. It's not like working in uh, Switzerland or, or working in France and Europe. The m markets which are difficult just for the, the conditions. Uh, but, I, but I do believe that, uh, um, and now maybe I'm saying something which the first panel uh, this morning on, on entrepreneurs, saying that uh, the world is going to be changed by small companies, entrepreneurs, and so on. I do think that the big corporations have a role to play as well. Sure. It's more difficult for a corporation like Philip Morris, like a multinational company, to change simply because uh, we already have a structure. There is clearly the pressure from the stock exchange, uh, but and we are a big uh, corporation with 70, 80,000 people. So before changing, it does take a more time. But what changes the world and what changes make the change is not the company; it's the people. And you find the people in yeah. the small entrepreneurial companies, the SMEs, and in the big corporation. It just takes longer. But it's the people that make the change. It's not the, it, it is not the, the, the company. But technology, I do think, is helping a lot um, for increasing transparency uh, in um, making the consumer having a much stronger voice. Because at the end of the day, politicians, uh, corporations, companies uh, listen to the end consumers because those are the ones that buy the product and if they don't buy it anymore, you have a problem. So I think the technology is helping a lot. Uh, even in the tobacco, uh, when I was here last year, I think I mentioned that uh, the European Union has, was going to introduce at that time, and now it's been introduced uh, um, as of May of this year, a full traceability of each single pack of cigarettes from the producer down to the point of sale. So each pack of cigarettes now is tracked up to the point of sale, and not talking about the bundle, the shipping case, and each pack of cigarettes. For the smokers in this room, if you turn around your pack at the bottom of your pack, you'll find a little uh, code, which maybe you're thinking what it is. It's not the barcode. The barcode, I think we're all familiar with it, that a, a stocking is stock management code, which all products have uh, in order to keep the stock management in, in the supply chain. This is a unique code for each pack. So you can trace back each single pack that has been produced by one company, sold to that distributor, to that wholesaler, down to that point of sale. Uh, and then, of course, you have apps that you can read that, that code and it gives you all the traceability, which uh, goes in line on the transparency I was making. So I see very, very similarity with, with, the, with, the, with the coffee. Maybe the drivers may be different uh, in, the, in the tobacco. Clearly, there's a big component of illicit trade. Uh, but the, the, there are a lot of similarity from the producers up to the consumers. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, and this is my vision when I created Wise Key, uh, I say, who cares who is behind? I want to have a direct relation between the farmer and the consumer. The rest is, 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 the, is, the, is, the, is the back end. It's like trying to understand how a mainframe works. You, what you want is to see the efficiency. Now it's totally inefficient for the reason we have seen. I mean, farmers and consumers are not in contact, and this is what gives the possibility of, of the back end to exploit the farmer because there's no accountability. 
the moment you create a, a peer to peer uh, society, which now we can with blockchain technology, decentralization of ledgers, the, the possibility of moving data from silos so everybody can share, we're going to be in an unprecedented wealth creation era where, where people are going to be able uh, to, to, to exchange services to the point, you know, that there's a very stream thinking in Davos that say, you're not going to be even an entrepreneur in five years' time. You're going to be a company. Every single human will be its own company. So you will be a legal entity through your digital identity. And you can sell your knowledge. If you are a good writer, you write books and you sell to six billion people. If you are a good uh, engineer, you, 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 you're going to be able, you don't need a bus. You don't need a, a somebody sitting on you. You will need big corporations that they act as a platform. Like planes need airports, you know, because they have to stop, fill, fill and go back again. But the role of a plane is, is to be on the air. But obviously it has to stop sometimes into the airport. The same thing for this concept of every person is a company. If you are your own company, you can then go and plug into the platform to get funding, to, to sell product. But once this is done, then you go back again and fly. You don't have to have the heaviness of creating a company. You know, when I created WireSkey, I left the UN and, and, and I, I put a, what I need to invest and I discovered I need $100 million just to start a company, which I raised. And it was amazing work, but I have to raise, and this took me 80% of my time. In our days, the, a young kid doing the same company will have to invest 100,000. And in 10 years time, there will be maybe 5,000 and so on. And to the point that one day will be nearly for free. Why? Because you have cloud system online, you can put your data on cloud, you can uh, get open source software. So, so we are in a society where the young generation, the millennials, they have amazing tools in their hands. And, and this is where I, I am coming from the, from the side of hope with those tools, if they use them properly with the uh, enthusiasm and, and aggressiveness that an entrepreneur has, they will solve major world problems that in our generation we were not able to solve. So, so Father, uh, one, uh, I asked uh, Nicola, Father Nicola, when I read the book, I asked him a question, and he helped me a lot on that answer, which is, uh, what is soul? What is the soul in AI? How AI reads a soul, a human soul? And in you give me this morning some ideas on quantum, I, I want to ask you that question again to you because this is a fascinating, this is a question, it's a, it's a billion dollar question that nobody has ever been able to answer properly. And every time I talk to engineers around the world, I say, okay, you can, you can uh, replace the human, mm -hmm. but what about the soul of the human? How is that reflected in technology? Okay, the, the, problem, the problem is that we have to overcome the dualistic uh, interpretation of soul and body mind and body, uh, because uh, this uh, is against, uh, a part against truth, but is against uh, the fundamental laws of physics, because uh, if uh, you imagine that uh, your soul, when I, I move my arm, is interacting, is changing energy, moving particles, moving electrons, or uh, bodily spirits are going into the card. <laughs> Uh, in the, you are violating the first principle of thermodynamics, the energy balance. So it's not th this the explanation. The explanation can be only the Aristotelian approach or Aquinas approach that um, soul is the organizing principle, the or ordering principle of uh, the movements uh, of the body. For this reason, it's necessary to recover the notion of uh, um, information, that is the um, physical basis of information. Pay attention. We know information theory from communication engineering is an entropy, you know, is Shannon entropy and so on. The problem is, which is the foundation of information in physics, in quantum physics? Because uh, you know that uh, there is an interpretation of quantum physics is the informational approach to quantum physics, because uh, information is uh, an immaterial physical magnitude. I repeat, immaterial physical magnitude, because uh, it's related <laughs> with the notion uh, I wanted to explain, but we don't have time, probably, uh, of uh, quantum vacuum. What is uh, quantum vacuum? <laughs> A uh, quantum vacuum is uh, the, mm, the, the continuum of the quantum fields at their ground state. Pay attention, ground state 
doesn't mean the absolute zero, the equilibrium, okay? Because uh, you cannot reach the absolute zero by the third principle of thermodynamics. So that the quantum vacuum has a temperature, a temperature that is higher than zero, okay? So you can imagine <laughs> the quantum vacuum uh, as a, um, uh, because the quantum vacuum is everywhere in the organization of matter. It's also, um, for instance, uh, when you, you are dealing with the ferromagnetic phase, uh, that is, uh, you change uh, from the non-ferromagnetic to the ferromagnetic phase of, um, of, uh, of metals. Well, what happens? It happens that uh, in the quantum vacuum situation, the fields are, uh, and the vectors of magnetization of the quantum fields are in orientating in all the direction. This is a condition of symmetry. Uh, it's a disorder, but it's a symmetry. Pay attention. <laughs> this is the, um, a contradiction about the notion of order and disorder, because uh, if we speak uh, about the geometrical ordering, you know that the geometrical space is isotropic. That is, all the direction in the geometrical space are equivalent. So, if uh, you have that the vector magnetization, this is an example of quantum vacuum, are uh, pointing in whichever direction in the three-dimensional space, <laughs> this is a disordered situation, not an ordered situation. Because it is, uh, uh, in, f in fact, uh, you know, that chance um, uh, and necessity are to, <laughs> are to face the same problem, because in geometry is the same. <laughs> chance means without a goal, no? Because uh, it's a chance. But when you have a goal, you have a, direct, a direction to point. Okay? So, uh, the fundamental mechanism in quantum field theory is the spontaneous breaking of symmetry. The spontaneous breaking of symmetry happens when uh, all, uh, all the particles, all the molecules in this day, or atoms, are the uh, vectorization in one only direction. And this happens for long range correlations happen at the quantum level. In this uh, long range of correlations, uh, if uh, quantized, are a name, are Nambu Goldstone bosons. Okay? In the case of uh, magnetization phenomena, magnons are named. Or in the name of uh, oscillation, of uh, mm, elastic oscillation, mechanical oscillation of uh, molecules are phonons, probably. A, a condition of quantum vacuum is like uh, uh, an orchestra when all the people are tuning their uh, instrument, and so it's a cacophony, no face coherence. But when uh, the director stick, so they go in phase, okay, they go in phase, and there is an ordering. <laughs> so this ordering is a physical magnitude. If you see at the quantum field theory equations, you have that these uh, bosons are not quanta of matter, not quanta of energy, are not fermions, electrons, are not quanta of uh, energy, photons, gluons, okay? <laughs> that is the quanta of the, of the interaction fields but a quanta of the coherent modes of being in phase of uh, quantum fields. Okay? This is quanta of ordering. And uh, because it's an ordering, it's a logic. <laughs> because uh, the ordering relation is the basis of semantics. Uh, very roughly. If I say P implies Q, okay, if P then Q, when it is true? It's true when the set Q 
includes the subset P. So there is an ordering, you know? And uh, um, this ordering relation is logic, is already in quantum physics. Because in quantum physics, we have uh, uh, this long correlation, uh, long correlation wave that are a sort of an implementation in modern physics of the notion of formal causality. So, Father, uh, will we, and will so we... uh, I finish. <laughs> this happens. Uh, sorry, this happens also in our brain. We are in a quantum. Okay, <laughs> this is also in our brain. That is, uh, you can study from the standpoint of quantum field theory our brain, and uh, you find uh, that uh, this uh, this quantum correlation concerns uh, the dipoles, dipoles, electrical fields characterizing water. Because remember that life, um, biological molecules are active only in, in, y, in uh, water. Okay, so, and then all the organic matters. So, if you go in phase with these fields, you have a chemical reaction typical of biochemistry. And uh, <laughs> what is a soul? <laughs> soul is this. Because, uh, sorry, soul is this. No, it seems strange because we are acquainted to think of soul like a uh, uh, ghost in machine. No, please. It's uh, an ordering relation. An ordering relation involving the, uh, think an intentional movement, okay? Intentional movement means that uh, you, you are connecting, you are synchronizing in some way. Neurons of the amygdala, huh? you know, in the limbic system. Neurons of the sensory cortex. Neurons of the associative cortex. Neurons of the motor cortex. All in phase. Uh, there are millions of synapses far. Uh, each synapse reacts in 75 milliseconds, that is one tenth of a second. If the connection is through synapses, how many months is necessary? Please make the multiplication. This is science, <laughs> please. Okay, but uh, this is a phase, this is a quantum entanglement. Okay, but quantum entanglement doesn't require, doesn't concern only inside the brain. For instance, quantum entanglement one is the basis... Father, one minute, because... Okay, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> only, only one other minute. All is, uh, requiring, is requiring also for... Uh, because we see in the uh, optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum and they all in the infrared. Because we are in phase with these uh, <laughs> frequencies. The all is in frequency with the infrared. Huh? And so, uh, now, we are working in another, uh, in another, um, another uh, um, project about the um, pathological pain. And one of the, the problems is, is to study this phenomenon for which we have already a lot of ev evidence, but we have to study, that when there is feeling, emotional feeling between two persons, uh, I show, I have also the slides, but we have time. <laughs> uh, uh, the, some parts of their brains are in phase. And uh, what is the relation with God? <laughs> is this a relationship? Okay, remember that in the Bible, uh, you have uh, that, uh, the, uh, what is uh, the, the spirit? Uh, the spirit uh, is not uh, the air, it's the breath. Okay? So, the, you have a kiss of life, uh, this is... Uh, <laughs> reanimation, okay, in English. A kiss of life between God and uh, the puppet of, <laughs> of, uh, of uh, argilla, of, yeah. of, of earth. And so this is this, this relationship, and this is an ordering relation that is, of course, this is for the believer. And for finish for the creation, remember that <laughs> um, probably you know that there is a lot of, uh, of uh, books uh, uh, interpreting creation with the 
face coherence organization of the quantum vacuum. Okay, Kramer, also the last book of, uh, of Hawking and so on. So the problem is that in the Bible, <laughs> there is, uh, uh, because okay, in this way, you create organization from matter, no? And so this is creation, order from chaos. Uh, but uh, <laughs> pay attention, in the Bible, in the first two verses of the Bible, is uh, God created heaven and earth. And the earth was an informed void. But the breath, or the breath, not the spirit, the breath of God is over the water of the abyss. That is, the, um, the, the water of the abyss <laughs> is oscillating, <laughs> is, a, is a waving water, living water. And this is before time, okay? Before time, because the time is uh, when you break the symmetry in the abyss. Yes. First day, separation of light from darkness without uh, firmament. Second day, separation of the lower water, upper water by the firmament and so on. So that, <laughs> What is the creation? The creation is God, that also the quantum vacuum or the first matter of uh, the, is created by God, depends on God, and not in time, from eternity. Yes. Father, let's stay there in eternity. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I really thank you for, for what you had just said because the subject is so complex. And, I, and again, whether you're a believer or not believer or you are a, a, a physician or not, a computer person, this is a fundamental question. And, and one of the things that, that we are reaching conclusion for a very big experts on quantum is that maybe quantum will be a way to, to, to explain God, as simple as that, in the future. So I, I really thank you for that. I think I would mm -hmm. love to continue talking to you <laughs> and, 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 and AI your brain on it. No, it's nice to see how it works with because, quantum uh, computing. Exactly. And next year we'll bring a demo on how that works. <laughs> Okay, deal? Yes. Deal. Okay. <laughs> okay, so because we are running, we only have 42 seconds left. So uh, I would like uh, now to move to the uh, signing of the declaration. So we have done a declaration. You guys can sign in the, uh, in the wall there. You also have a, a link on the, on the website of, of Sir Matt Summit where you can go and sign. And, and again, this is non-binding. This is only a, an, an intention to work together towards putting, uh, with the help of, of multinationals and organizations that they have the firepower to make it happen, to reduce this, point, this two point uh, three trillion dollar economy, which we'll, we believe with the, with the help of goodwill technology and, and perseverance, we, we can reduce drastically for the future of our kids. Because the worst case scenario is that we lose that battle and, and then uh, people will make more money on the illicit trade than they will make on the illicit trade. So uh, we are gonna move now there. We're gonna be signing the, the declaration. Uh, uh, we'd like to, um, uh, if you, got, you guys want to join us before the next, uh, the next panel, I don't think you have the, the time. I would like just to thank the panel for, for their support. It's amazing uh, people, uh, amazing commitment. Uh, individually, each of you, also thank you for your uh, patience and participation. And uh, if you have any, uh, any uh, question to us, please, you're free to, to do it. Thank you very much, and thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you very much.
right or left? <laughs> Go this way? Yeah. So, all right. Yeah, we just... Yeah, no worries. Yes. Keep it on your. Ah, we should keep it on the.